So, g'day everyone. Uh, it's been a pretty heavy and hectic day. We can't see our audio feedback at the moment because the... Unfortunately, I've uh, done a little bit of damage to the microphone, re microphone receiver. Okay. Yeah, that's from it falling over in the wind all the time. Oh. Yeah, it only works one way around. <laughs> so, uh, we've yeah, sh shot a few... So, shot a few camels today. Um, in fact, it's a bit over 40 today. Uh, but Danny shot somewhere around 80 yesterday, which is uh, pretty significant. He, he ran out of ammo, which, yeah, you get. And but we saw another 30. We just didn't have... Um, I reckon I got them today. Yeah. The ones that we did a David Attenborough moment with. We did, we did. We, we really need to end up getting a uh, bit of a, well, I would love to have a new tray for like my new ute. One where I've got a gun safe so I can go to town and it's all locked up and everything. And then when I come home and I see camels as I get home, I can just pull it out and start to get to work. But that aside, we've got some camel, which I, the video will be going live tomorrow of when I harvested it. Uh, and we're just gonna cook some up. And effectively, we've grabbed from our fresh food people, one of their recipe books on cooking and we treat camel just like beef because it is just like beef. It's a really lean meat, it's lovely. Um, the most baffling thing about it is that people seem to have some sort of strange idea that it's going to taste gamey. Now, I sometimes set people up when Jasmine is cooking camel for dinner. I prime them right up so that they turn around and say, oh, it tastes just a little bit gamey because her number one thing is to turn around and ask, what is gamey? You know, what, what does a gamey meat actually taste like? Um, is it all mental? Because out here at the station, we reckon that one of the best Rangeland beef that you can have, so beef from out in station country, is actually the camel. And this comes down to the grazing range. Now, the camel has a long neck and they can eat things that are high up, but also, they can graze just about double the amount that the cattle can. And it's just due to the digestibility. They've got almost like the next level rumen digestive system. They've got bacteria in their system, which it has been suggested that it's better to have the camels drinking and allowing some of the bacteria from their cud into the water that your cattle eat and that will increase the productivity of your beef. Hmm. We, we beef cows. Now, one of the main things uh, that we have with the camels when it comes down to dressed weight, anyone who's done work with sheep or with beef has always talked about carcass weight. Now, carcass weight of a camel is actually significantly lower than beef cattle, but that's because they are perfectly evolved as a desert animal and they are just set to survive. Um, really, they are the animal that you should be farming out in these areas, but there is just no appetite for camel. You know, there's a bit of a, you know, camels are a dirty animal, camels spit, camels are ugly, but really, um, alpacas and llamas probably spit more than camels do because I've never seen a camel spit. So I'm going to grab a beer and we are going to start cooking up a Cajun camel with some charred corn salad. So I'll be a moment while I grab a beer and we've got, we've got Great Northern, we did resupply on that but I'm still working my way through the forex. Okay. Um, jumping in here, 
um, LJ Adventure. Um, you've commented and said um, we should start selling the meat to stores and stuff. Um, it's a very big, uh, no thanks, that is a very, very big um, and complex um, logistical situation. We live hundreds and hundreds of kilometres um, to the closest abattoir and there's only one abattoir, I believe I'm correct, Jack, there's one abattoir that can handle camels and that is it. Um, and that's thousands of kilometres away. Technically there's two um, and there's apparently a difference between a slaughterhouse and an abattoir, but there's one place in West Australia where you can slaughter a camel for human consumption and that's south of Perth by like four hours. So that's 1,600 kilometres away. Yep. And then you've got Peterborough. You do have Peterborough. Which is in South Australia, where they do do it. But all of the um, studies that have been done every time. So, again, I should really release that report that was done on the feasibility of camel for human consumption. Effectively, everything that came out of it was that you'd be making perhaps on a good day in the best case scenario, $1 per animal. Now, that's taking into account all of your costs of capturing, managing, and then getting Feeding, the animal transporting to yeah. where they can get slaughtered. You would only make $1 if you're looking good. Now, I can say that the economic cost of a camel on the property is greater than a dollar and we only shoot 750 780 a year you know 780 dollars for the amount of effort it's not worth it no. um and then unfortunately uh in wa we are there's no licensed um no jack will get the word incorrect on this the mobile abattoirs yes so for human consumption there's no mobile abattoirs for human consumption of large game also, something that we need to push as a legislative change is to allow the harvest of game meat for human consumption. And camel are you know, listed as a game meat, same as your deer, but it's that human consumption and being able to then sell it. So mm. there's no issue with whacking it yourself and eating it yourself, but we can't, but sell, it. We can't sell it. Yeah. And what we would love to be able to do is do in-field halal, kosher, anything camel meat we would love to make a market of the camels but the demand's not there and the value is not there well and that's it yeah and that's where being able to do some infield work like that would be great because if you've jumped in and had a look at the video we did a few months ago with ethan it's about why camel meat is a sustainable pet food people like that we're getting high quality meat into a chiller very quickly. Yeah. And so if we can do that for human consumption, the value has gone up and that'd be great to see. Even as a pet meat, um, it was the highest cost to get that meat and it was the lowest um, return on um, it ended up being one of the lowest value meats. Lowest and value meat and the highest cost to get it. Because he also did the testing of the meat because there was a rumour that the Indo Spice, which is from the India Flora or Indica Flora, which is a. A plant out here that the camels. Not oh, no. Here. There's a plant that the camels can eat that has that poison in it. We don't have it here. Yep. We've tested, we've proven it. And the toxicity from that harms carnivores, somehow, not humans, but it will affect dogs and it will affect lions. Now, the meat that Ethan had is certified clear, non-detectable, and yeah, that stuff is just great, great meat. But yeah. it's um, unfortunate that there's been a couple of things that damage the reputation and idea of getting things to the market. Yeah, um, so another question people have asked, have we thought about commercializing camels through hunts that is, Kettle of it's, fish it's, a fan, it's a fantastic idea um, for us to do tourism, which is where that would fall under or classify under. We have to get a whole new 
um, set of approvals and... Um, Basically, it's going to cost us a bucket load of money to be able to get prepared to do hunting tourism. We have to get governmental approval well, for tourism and all of that sort of stuff. We have to get approval from the Minister for Agriculture mm. to be able to do anything like that. And it comes under a diversification permit. Then we also have to get native title approvals. And then when you go through the native title approvals, you then need to pay some licensing and clearances and then every time that you remove an animal there is a cost to it and we'll probably jump into it when we start talking about our shed build and upgrade to our power plant but we're not we don't have the phys the facilities to house people here for tourism effectively yeah, yeah. Our accommodation is not great it's it's not amazing uh we want to upgrade it but uh all in good time it's money. Yeah, cattle It'll, first. Yeah, cows first. Cows first. Cows first, last and always. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> oh, there's another one we're going to get to, but to start with, we, which we will get to in a later video. We're, we're not sponsored by these guys. No, 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 we're not sponsored, but we just got back from, <laughs> we just got back from town because we were in town for, well, I was in town for school with the kids and Jack had to go for some medical stuff. And we, I picked up one of the free magazines at Woolworths while we were down there and we're using a recipe out of that to make our dinner tonight. Now, now it's a, essentially it's just a beef meal. Um, you know, the recipe just calls for beef, but we are just using, supplementing the beef with the camel because it's same, same really. Um, now, while we are preparing this, thanks George, Uber cow. That's been George's idea for quite a while, George Summers. Um, some background history of the station. So station or familial history? Um, there's quite a bit of obviously station history. Um, if you want to get into Prenti Downs as a station without us as part of it. Um, Prenti Downs Station, Carnegie Station, Wongawal Station, and I think there's a couple of other little ones as well. Maybe Naminga Station and Yelma Station. All used to be one big station owned by one family. Um, I believe it was in the 70s that that split because the family, the um, Crown decided that families weren't allowed to own that much land anymore. So they split the stations. Um, and that's how it became then Carnegie Station, Prenti Down Station, and we did a station, so we are all neighbours. We all used to, it all used to be one station. So the homestead was put here in the 70s and Prenti Downs became Prenti Downs in the 70s. There's a book, actually, if anyone's really interested. There is a book that uh, goes... Is it in the... It's in the bookshelf, yeah, that goes through that history. Um, yeah, and so they all used to be right run owned by one family and also they had one managing family that managed all of them and that was the Linky family. Um, we happened to buy Prenti Downs off of uh, Will Linky who was the son, um, well one of the sons, his mum and dad um, ran or managed the properties when they were all one really, really big one. Um, and then, so that's the history of Prenti Downs. Um, and then if you want to get a bit into the family history, because I wasn't sure quite if you wanted the station history or the family history for us being here and being on the station, it's Jack was a farmer down in Cascade near Esperance and his brothers still are. We're still one. Yeah. Yeah, so if you find that book. Oh, go find the book. Remember, you've got a microphone. Everyone will hear everything, you know, the rustling and the swearing at the bookshelf. Um, So a bit of the history of the station. Yeah, so there's definitely that book, the resource, which is, uh, and if her droughts are bitter, but in terms of how us as the Carmody's ended up here at this, this point where we've got a station, was that we, yeah, went on a bit of a drive. So uh, livestock's been a part of the family farming business for quite a long time. And it goes back into when the Carmody's were still farming in Wagen and my grandfather set up bulk silage to feed 
lot cattle which had come off stations and yeah grown effectively for west farmers or you know coals and woolworths back in the day now we got out of cattle when we moved to esperance for in, in the 70s and went into more sheep and we got out of sheep in the early 2000s and that was when maryland 2 toms brook and Clare Downs were all one. Now, if you, you know, hear Tom's Brook and you think, hang on a second, there's a YouTube channel. Yes, Tom's Brook Farm, the YouTube channel. JH is my cousin. And he and I, we, you know, and Tom and George and David, we all worked together. And then we had a split. It was basically on cousins stage. Once we got to the age where us as cousins were old enough to run and operate our own businesses. We would split the business and you know, keep going. We are all very amicable. <laughs> um, and you would see that if you watch the Glass Cage podcast, which John and George do together. And hopefully there's going to be a Christmas special where David jumps in as well, which is just going to be all hectic. Splitting the farm and then we roll on to... Tom running Claire Downs and I dropped out of uni and came back to the farm. George was working for Elders and when George had finished his time with Elders, I finished up at the farm and I went into Precision Ag. But in amongst all of that, we had done a trip up into this country to look at stations and buy a station. And it was around 2012, 2013, that mum and dad went back up to the out, back up to Alice, uh, and to the mine that they'd started up to shut it down. On the way, on the Great Central, they saw a lot of camels and thought, "Hang on a second, we could possibly do something with all of these animals that are free-range beef. Let's turn a problem into a solution." So that when we started looking at properties that were surrounded and affected by camels. And we were looking at Balladonia, which is on the Nullarbor. And we started looking at Printy Downs and dad got involved with Printy Downs doing a couple of musters. And then we, yeah, sort of went through the stages of us coming up and having a look and getting a feel for the country chalk forwards a couple of years where I've gone to John Deere dealerships and working in precision agriculture. I get a phone call saying, well, we bought the station. Do you want to come back and help out? And I did. I went from an office job uh, teaching farmers and technicians the ins and outs of the precision agriculture systems that John Deere had to offer to being on a cattle station fixing stuff out of anything and everything that we can find and shooting camels and other feral animals. So that's how we ended up with the station. We thought there was something we could do with camels that was good. We needed to help reduce our chemical and pest burden on the farm with things like ryegrass. And we worked out that cutting hay was a good way to do it. The best way to make money out of hay is to grow beef and the cheapest way to grow beef is to breed it yourself and the cheapest way to breed it yourself is to have a station. So all of those seven and a half steps led us to buying a station. Right, so Jasmine has kindly sparkled some Cajun seasoning onto our beef here. And by beef, I mean camel, our fresh camel. I mean, it's been frozen for a couple of days, yeah, but the camel. today's camel. Yeah, it's the camel that I shot with the speed line just when I found out that I had the approval for the NPR, the pump action, which has been really, really effective. Both rifles are good. One of them's potentially better than the others. So, we're going to do a light sear on this. Do we need to get couscous? Uh, I'm already on that. You're on the couscous? I'm on that. Right. Mm -hmm. Do 
Now, just in the last week, we had the um, Saturday night, we had the grand, what would you call it, the grand dinner that Ant hosts. Well, we didn't have the dinner. No, we didn't have it. Does Ant host it or does he go to it? He hosts it. Oh, didn't know that. Yeah, it's his wine and uh, dinner night. And Camel featured on the recipe list there. So he, um, actually Ant didn't cook it, Pom did. And now, your mum, and your mum. And mum, yeah. So if you wonder who we're talking about when we say Pom, in a couple of videos early on when we were cutting down the old dome shelter and getting up to a couple of other shenanigans, we even, we actually filmed an explanation of my plane crash with POM, but we just never got around to releasing it because we're not quite sure about how to handle that. But POM is quite the chef and he did an amazing job. At some stage, I will pop in the videos and photos where he turned into ball rust and he also did some rissoles, which was pretty cool. But I must say, my favorite way of preparing camel is quite basic, very down to earth, and that would be camel and sudza, which is something that we've... For people who don't know what sudza is. Well, okay, if you've been to Southern Africa, there is like a maize meal, which you can cook up, and it's kind of a, a staple, it's a starch. Hmm. So it's like mashed potato, but it's out of maize. And I'd have to say, it's probably the best way to have camel, you know. In your opinion. So someone's asked, how's it going today? And I think today's been a day. Today started with a plan and you were going to be home by 10 o'clock and you were going to get your lunch and you were going to continue up the north and none of that happened. No. No, and we just kept on coming across camels and other problems. Ooh. But all the problems have been solved. Well, not all of them, but... All of them have a solution. So it's not a bad day. It just wasn't the day that was planned. No, but that's it. It's dynamic plans, dynamic operations out here. So we started out with just a simple one of getting down south and taking out some camels and fixing a pump, which I thought was a little bit lazy. So we, um, Danny and I set out this morning with a good plan didn't find the camels where we thought we'd see them and then we checked on the live network that we have and saw a bunch of camels which looked a lot like the ones that I was looking for at another water point. And so then we went, right, let's change our plan, dive out there and go tackle some camels. Uh, the time for us here in West Australia is uh, 1934, 734 and yeah. We, it's, kids are in bed, hopefully. One of them keeps coming out. Try an alpaca if you get a chance. It's a camelette and tastes beautiful, like lamb, but missing the lanolin taste and a finer meat grain. Yes, yeah, I, um, for a while, Jasmine and I have been somewhat discussed. I wanted to get a pet alpaca. You still do want a pet alpaca. Well, we've got a pet camel now. He's out there in we, the yard. We do have a pet camel now. Yeah. But then it became, we don't really want to sh shear. Yeah, shear. The alpaca. Is it an alpaca or a llama that you have to shear? And this is where we had to, we weren't sure actually. One has hair, one has wool. One has hair, one has wool, and we don't want the effort of the wool. Well, and that's where we've got now our prime stock. We've got Biltong out there. So we can just run the clipper over and built on the camel. Make some yard. Which also we had a thought last night and it was, I'm not sure if anyone's, or if it's interesting, many people, but Twiggy Forest has just bought a, a Cobra. Cobra. A Cobra No, hats. no, was that? Um, no, no, Gina Reinhardt bought Dry as a Bone. Yeah. Twiggy Forest has bought a Cobra hats. Right, now, so for those who aren't in Australia and a bit of the story of a Cobra, and it was, you know, a dozen rabbits in every hat. So, like my slouch hat, well, yeah, our cobra hats, it was that 
they are made out of uh, rabbit fur. And on the rabbit proof fence, it used to be a big thing, you know, you'd get a couple, little, couple of cents, a couple of guinea um, to shoot the rabbits. And then they turned the rabbits into, into hats. And so a cobra did that, you know, turned the pest into something productive. And, you know, the lads wore them to war. Then we have the Akubra hat, which, you know, is still one of the big things of the outback. I mean, we've both still got them. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. And our thought was, how cool would it be if Akubra was able to do a camel hat? Yeah, use camel wool. It's wool, isn't it? It is a wool. A I think hair? it's a wool. It's a, yeah, I don't know. It's very short. It and they very... do, like, it's a coat that varies. It is, but you don't have to um, shear them. You shear alpacas from Matt and... Well, then we want a llama, not an alpaca. Yeah, well, would a, which one has a better twiny building twiny? aspect? Twiny building. That you can turn. You know how you have to spin wool? Yeah, no, but we don't want wool because then you have the effort of having to shear it. Yeah, but then we can learn how to... And who's going to be doing that? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Right. Uh, so, Rob has asked, being remote, where do you go? What's your go-to place for shopping? I'm sure Woolies don't deliver. I guess it would be bulk shop, etc. Yeah, no, it's a bulk shop from Woolworths. We're about to do release a video on it, actually. Yeah, hopefully Ish, soon. It was actually a small shop because it's mm. only for a couple of weeks worth. But yeah, we use Woolworths, and we'll use Click and Collect when someone's coming up to the station, we'll make sure that we've got a whole load of stuff. So see, we're very up. opportunistic. No one ever comes to the station empty handed. Except Ant forgets beer. Yes, but whenever we know someone's coming, whether it's our own truck, whether it's Jack's mum and dad, whether it's visitors, we always, always take the opportunity to get groceries. And most of the time it's the fresh stuff that we need. Yeah. We never go, we never miss an opportunity. I think one of the best systems that we ever had and plans really that we we had in place was to our south 100 kilometers there was a potash mine and that was australian potash company they were early days but they had a large area and small crew which was really like quite good we've got a very highly rated airstrip it's actually an n1 rating which means that you can do night landings on it for well it's not instrument rated but you can do a night landing now, the mining company were chartering in a flight from Jandicott straight to Prenty Downs and then driving down to the other station to run their operations. And it was all to do with quarantine and COVID and making sure that everyone was clean and clear rather than going through like the commercial airport. Best system ever was the landing fees. And it was, oh, should we pay you guys landing fees? And it was not. Nah, Look, seriously, the only thing that we want to make sure is when you come up, bring some fresh milk for the coffees that we're going to make because over here, we make sure that being remote and out in here, the outback, we want a good coffee. Now, that was much appreciated by the guys at the mine, well, the guys and girls at the mine, and so they always would bring some milk up. And then the other part was to make sure that they brought some berries and fruit for the kids because everything else we can sort of deal with and manage, but yeah, fresh lettuce here and there was really appreciated. And it was a great system. And you had different people, they brought the scraps up from the mine, like the food scraps from the kitchen. They would go into the chook pen. Yeah. And it's just really unfortunate that mine has now... Yeah, unfortunately gone under. Yeah. Um, now, Stephen Medio, our butchering process and what cuts of meat we eat. We've actually got a fair few videos where we're cutting meat and showing which bit we cut and what we eat. From the camel or beef? Uh, he hasn't specified. Well, I am not great at cutting him up and I've got some friends who are butchers and they always laugh at me. <laughs> Biggest thing is... Sharpen your knives more, Jack. Yes. Uh, and I actually watch a YouTube video every time I'm cutting up 
an Fair, animal. Yeah. Yeah. But camel, we just take the back strap. We've got plenty of videos on that. Um, yeah, asking if George Summers is coming back. You'll have to ask George. He was. George is in the he chat. He was on the chat a few minutes ago. So, you know, George, are you yeah. coming back or not? You know, answer the people's questions. Yeah, like, read the chat, everyone. It's it's there. He's on, he's on point he now. He said he's coming back. So, George. Well, no, he back. said. If you can fly down and pick me up, I will come up. That's not in the chat. No, but he said that when he was up here. Well, the plane's coming in, up tomorrow, George. Just jump up. No, but it's George or more ammunition. <laughs> These are the questions. Now, the plane is been having some serious issues. Uh, in fact, both aircraft, uh, our Ventura aircraft, which are the new ones, have been having some issues and yeah it would we're not exactly happy about that uh but if i was in australia and i was looking to buy a new aircraft i would hold off for a little bit for a little bit to you know buy a uh, a ventura or anything from icp or even put a rotax engine in it yeah. um <clears throat> you need a microphone yeah i know i was right near the thing um oh. Oh. Yeah, just pass it to me for a second. How about you just clip it on your shirt? Are we able to grow our own food? No, yeah. you don't need the magnet. You can just clip. Yeah. No, we are able to grow our own food. In fact, I have a bucket here of our own homegrown tomatoes. Bucket, it's a colander. Um, no, we do grow our own food. Um, I do have the veggie patch out the front here. Um, I guess... The, cap, the, the little calf oh, at the has moment, been... The, the two calves have been living in it. So the bull calf, the beef bovine calf and the um, camel calf have been living in it. We've just kicked the bull cattle out um, because he has started nibbling on the strawberries. So he's, he's lost veggie, veggie patch privileges. He's now on the lawn. Um, but yeah, no, I do have a veggie patch. Um, and we do grow as much as we can ourselves. It's a slow process, mostly with the things like the trees, the fruit trees and stuff, that's slow. Um, and we have nothing established, so everything is taking a long time. Now, JH has just mentioned that George has got Ooh, plenty of free, got time. free time. And a plane's coming up tomorrow. Now, so. George missed out on a lot of mustering. And we're going to do some mustering next week. So, George, if you get over to Claire Downs and you jump in with Gaz and Rigby, <laughs> you could come up if you're keen. So... Um, do we have private pilots drop in? We've had the RAF drop in um, once just for, you know, it was a convenient place to land and it's a very good airstrip. But, uh, yeah, we've had a couple of private pilots land. One of the things that we've been toying with the idea, and it'll probably be better in a bit of a nicer time to fly. So for winter up here, flying is just incredibly good. You, don't get much more stable than winter in the middle of WA because you don't have sudden breezes and all of that. And we've thought about the idea of doing planes to Prenti, which is over planes yeah. over Prenti. Yeah. I think she. Want, I think your mum suggested planes over Prenti. Well, planes to Prenti. Yeah. Light aircraft. You know, do a RA Oz thing and yeah, fly in. So RA Oz is the Recreational Aviation Australia, which is the light aircraft license. So the little Savannah, that's a RAOS aircraft. The Venturas are a VH aircraft. So they come under a different license. Okay. So, yeah. And unfortunately I can't see the audio level from Jasmine. Oh, it's just background, it's fine. Oh, put it back on. Ah, oh, cool. Uh, the garlic that we were growing, uh, yeah, the last batch, which Occasional Travels has pointed out, went really well. This year, not so well. We're looking at doing an expansion project on our veggie patch, and we want to tidy up some of our other things in the veggie patch and start going further and further out. Now, a lot of people have asked us about irrigation and how much can you um, how much can you irrigate? And 
It's interesting. According to the legislation, we're allowed to irrigate, I believe, five acres for horticulture for produce for the station and staff, which five acres is, you know, not, not a small amount. Um, which, yeah, is um, something we could really play with if we got to it. But we like our raised beds, and our raised beds are something that we've kind of grabbed from a YouTube channel called Self Sufficient Me, and he's a ex army guy who was an engineer, and he's like a pleasure to watch. I, I'd have to say that he Mike does. is just yeah great to watch. Um, and yeah, hunting and stuff. You said you thought you said RAF. Uh, yeah, so R double A F. Yeah. Um, um, did you choose this lifestyle, or was this something you have done since you were younger? I I'm mean, an, I'm I chose eight, my husband, which got me the lifestyle, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm an eight-year veteran of this. You're an eight-year veteran. <laughs> Jack's always been a farmer. He's always been a farmer. Oh, I did other things. Yeah, but. He, you've always, he's always been a farmer. It's never too late to become a farmer. No, it's never too late to become I a farmer. I wanted to be an architect. I I grew up in Perth. I, my I mum and dad still in live Perth. in Jack, you grew up on a farm. You did a few years in Perth. Anyway, I yeah, I'd never set foot on a farm until I married Jack. Um, yeah, self sufficient. No, before 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 we got married. Oh, you know what I mean. Self-sufficient me, he's fantastic. For your veggies research, wicking beds. Yeah. Water's not real. Water saving beds aren't really a concern for us. We don't need to save water in our veggie patch. We've got heaps of it. Um, our biggest problem actually is protecting it from... Wind. The hot, the hot, hot wind. Because we don't have a lot of established trees around... The house, there's no windbreak. It's the hot wind that causes this problem. It's not the um, needing to save a bit of water. Um, At but, one stage, we were putting 4,000 litres a day onto the lawn and the veggie pack. Yeah, and our dirt. Um, we've got some heavy clay material. Um, Very first off, um, so before I grab a beer. I'll take it one. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, right, hopefully that's working. Now, a number of months ago, both of my brothers and I travelled over, well, I flew over to Waluna. George and Tom, with our agronomist, drove up from the farm to Waluna, and we caught up, and then we went and had a look at property over there which had water licensing for irrigation and we did a reasonable amount of soil samples and investigation to see what you could actually grow over there and overwhelmingly we found out that anything anything you want to grow there's the water there and you can get going like the fertility it's not hydroponic there's a, a decent amount of nitrogen in the soil so we can actually start pumping something serious. And there used to be a vineyard in Wilona, and there also was a orchard growing orange trees. And I was blown away when we saw the size of the processing plant and the shed that used to be there. So, yeah, it's, um, there's potential, but it's a very difficult area to get into in irrigation in the centre here. Uh, our drinking water, rain tanks or underground? I want rain tanks. Oh, I, just I love rain tanks. We just haven't done it. Haven't done this. We've only had this house here since 2018 and we've had a lot of problems between there and now and we focused on getting the garden. Getting what we had to get done done yeah. and everything else will have to come later. Yeah. But yeah, we really want rain, ta rain tanks. Um, rain water's best. Uh, when we actually build our new workshop, which we've got all the steel, it's all there ready to go. 
and we've got to go through like where we're going to place it and how we're going to fit it out. And we'll do that as kind of a walk through the yard and design. We want to set the shed up to collect rainwater because it's great for your radiators and window washing and all those sorts of things, which having a bigger, nicer workshop is going to give us a little bit more of an ability to perform more regular maintenance. It's just like my, um, my new rifle, it's easy to maintain and clean, so you do it more often. If it's very tricky and difficult and an arduous task to do it, you're not so likely. So yeah, it's um, once we've got that work workshop built up, we'll get to it and we'll have that nice fresh water there collected yeah. for all of this. Uh, but so what we do do for our drinking water here in the homestead is we run it through reverse osmosis. Yeah. Um, hunting and stuff said, you don't know where we are in Australia. We are almost the center of Western Australia. Yeah, so uh, a really easy one to uh, look up, like the point of reference, if you want to get a geographic location, is look up Lake Carnegie in Australia, and then you will see where where we are. We're the southern half of that and northern half of Lake Wells. Probably easier than us trying to mangle together a map. Yeah. Um, and occasional travels again saying, yeah, it's a shame that um, desert, was it Desert Gold in Waluna? Um, yeah, there was a... Closed down. It was, it was definitely a shame. And someone had a crack at doing it again recently. Like, in, I think they failed in 2018. But there's a lot of extension. Yeah, other other factors. Ex external factors, yes. Yes. Now, if you want to, that is a piece of the freshly cooked. Oh, your you, you fresh camel. Fresh like camel beef. Cool. That is a tear apart kind of a. It's going to be really low resolution, but that's lovely. That's beautiful. That's awesome. Now, that Cajun seasoning on that. Ah, uh, it's paprika. Not. Yeah, it was paprika in all seasoning because we didn't actually have any Cajun, so I made it up. I've made Cajun before. <laughs> I, I made it tonight. Right. So we've Jasmine. I'll take the royal we out of it has just done the paprika beef <laughs> with a charred corn salad. Right, so that's us pretty much. That's our dinner, hang on, I'll bring it up. Oh, I just zoomed down to that. That's our dinner, which, yeah, probably doesn't look particularly great like that, but it's gonna taste fantastic. So, we're gonna get into that tomorrow, then, uh, occasional travels. Ant is on holiday. Yes, he's gone to Norway. Well, he's, has he gone yet? I don't know, maybe. He's, Ant has left the station, he's going to Norway for Christmas. Yes, so, so while we're dealing, like today was 40 degrees. He's gonna go for what, minus something? I don't know what it is in Norway over Christmas. I hope it's cold. I'm pretty sure it is cold. I really it? hope it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> so Very like cold. really Maybe cold. Maybe a really cold snap. Yes, super cold. So he goes, oh, you know what's good? The desert. The <laughs> desert's warm. You know. The, you know what I miss? Flies. I miss flies. I want to hear those words out of Ant's mouth. <laughs> I miss the flies. It'll probably never happen. But yes, Ant has been off station for a while now. He's having a nice big break. Um, yeah, maybe back sometime in January. February? I can't, I can't remember. To I don't know. It's on a calendar somewhere. <laughs> uh, no, the camel, we try to run with it uh, as medium rare. That's kind of the, the best way to go for it. It's our preference. Yeah, because there's no point turning it into boot leather. 
And when cooking it, I don't know, like someone said with the alpaca, it's like a little bit like lamb, but it's kind of a cross between beef and lamb with how light it can be. Yes. Um, hunting and stuff. Is it hunting and stuff? No, sorry. CLXV peppers. Dry heat or humid heat? We actually get both. Oh, we get both, yeah. We get both. But if it's like humid heat, I'm... It's very unpleasant. I'm gone. Um, but no, we, and I'd say we're probably close to relatively 50-50 on both. A lot of dry heat. I've had it here where on my smartwatch, it said it was 53 degrees and I was shooting a lot of animals. Yeah, like we, we fall into, I guess we're not in one um, climate versus another. We kind of fall on the, on the bottom of the tropical climate from the northern part of Australia. Um, because so, we get a lot of cyclones that come from there and a lot of our weather systems and then we've got the dry stuff. We get from... a lot of southern and northern weather systems yeah. and if you get both at once or in the year, it's incredible. It's a good season. Yeah. That's a great, great season. season. Yeah. yeah. And um, everyone who's from South Australia, I'm sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> you take our rain. Just yes. a low comes into the bite and then just no rain out. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, frustrating. But you make good wine. Very good really wine. Really good wine out of South Australia. You know, you win some, you lose some. Yeah. They just need to work out their renewable energy. Oh, let's not get into that sort of stuff. Going nuclear. Oh, I didn't add any garlic. I forgot to add garlic. That's a pickle. Well, occasional travels reminded us that we had some great garlic. We did have some great garlic. Garlic this year was not great. It just, yeah. Is that how we can like, make garlic great again? Oh, make garlic great again. Oh, God. What's going to happen to the baby camel when it grows up? Will you release it, keep it, or eat it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we're probably, I don't know. No, no, this is, I've been expecting this question. I because, have been. Because to be honest, we've talked about the same thing with the bull. Yeah. We're growing him up. He's going to be a beautiful steer and he will be great to eat. George isn't eating him. No. They're not having him on the farm. They're no, not no, gonna, no, they're not They're not, not, they're not the going to have Hardy on the farm. No, they're not going to have no. him on the farm. But, but no, we've talked about the same thing with the with the cattle, with the bull. Yeah, well, no, He's any be cattle. Great. Any He's, cattle. Yeah. Think about it. We, we get these animals. We... Put our time, effort, and love into making sure that we've got animals which are healthy, thriving, mm. and going well. And we grow them up for someone else to, you know, we, we fall in love with the animal, and then someone else chops their head off and turns them into hungry jacks. Uh, it's it's a real like it's a quandary for farmers. It is a quandary. Yeah, we're not sure what we're going to do with Mr. Bill Tong yet. Um, well, I don't know, his name might give it away. Yeah, yeah, his name probably gives it away. Although, um, we've got to work out. Anyone out there, or actually, we need to get Enoch up. Yes. Castrated camel. Castrated camel. Because oh. it's, it's an effort. I've heard that you've got to dig a hole in the ground and then sedate the camel, roll them over, and you've got the hole in the ground for the hump so they can be on their back. So then you can get to the sniffy bits. Interesting. But if we castrate him, no, he's going to be a long time pet. Yeah. Yeah. If we can manage that. Um, does the canning stock group go through our property? No, it does not. No, it goes through Glen Isle. It does. Go um, through Collins Place. Yes. So the, they kind of all go around us. There's the Great Central that goes around us, canning stock group goes around us, and the gun barrel goes around us. Yep. We are in the middle of the three. We're in the middle of nowhere. We are in nowhere. the middle of everywhere. Is there a market for growing flies? <laughs> Actually, yes. Now, Pom, Pom's sister? Maybe. I think Pom's sister actually is, um, yeah, it grows, I can't remember which fly it is. That's one for medical research or medical. Was it medical? Yeah. Yeah. So no, there is a market for growing flies. Probably not on camel carcasses or out here because they distance the market. Although we could fly them out. Oh, ho, ho. Um, George Summers says it's tempting. <laughs> well, do it, George. Do it. 
you know that you know you lead everyone to a boost in subscribers. Um, so I don't know if you could sort of beat the nineteen thousand subscribers we've gained in the last month, George. Mm. <laughs> uh, would we <laughs> didn't see that in Harvest? Would we ever move to the city? You never know what the future holds. I grew up in the city um, for my entire life, you know, childhood until moving out here with Jack. Would we ever move to the city? I don't know. We don't know. I mean, the girls are essentially either going to have to continue to do distance education with us here or they're going to be going to boarding school in the city. Um, so we'll have that back and forth quite a bit. But I don't know. We never know. I don't think Jack's dad probably ever thought that he would get into mining and be over in international countries for so long. So you just never know what the future has in store for us. It's not written in the cards and it's not written out of the cards, really. No. But do I very much like coming home after a week in town? Absolutely. Yeah, but that could just be home. It could just be home, exactly. Anyway, like people go on holiday and then come back home in a city and go, well, I like my apartment. No grass. There you go, maggots for fishing. We don't have any fish. Um, best way to eat sudso, grab a handful, make a fist. Yeah. Squeeze it out between your thumb and forefinger and dip it into your favourite saucer. Zoop. Yeah, mm. zoop. Put it in the soup. Yeah. yeah. No, sudso is, sudso is the bomb. Seriously, we, we did a, <laughs> Thank you, a run out. Um, we did the posties to printy operation where we had six postie bikes and we just cut out from yeah the southeastern part of the station and we just survived off the land and we uh, had sudza and and camel for a couple of nights straight and we did a lot of kilometres on postie bikes over dunes in the desert and. Yeah, it was a great expedition. If we ever do Posties to Prenti or Posties Unlimited, which we're thinking of doing just posty bikes around on the station, we would probably um, make sure that we record some of it because that was a lot of fun. Only one broken ankle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's dinner time. Probably, yeah. yeah. It's probably dinner time. Yeah, about time to eat some food. I think. Appropriate time to eat dinner. It looks good. I did an amazing job. Uh, square kilometres. Uh, oh, actually, I can answer this in a different way. I can't tell you the square kilometres, but I can tell you that we are 1.5 times the size of Luxembourg. So we are larger than a small European nation, which is a tax haven. <laughs> I mean, sure, sure, it's got something else going for it. Yeah, we're quite, we're quite big. But we were talking to one of the girls' teachers who um, is from Ukraine. And she was actually talking about um, the distance. obviously the war going on at the moment and ended up talking about, um, I don't know, I'll probably get it wrong, obviously one side at that time was under attack and the other side was relatively safe um, and how that they could hear the bombs well, and stuff from the safe you're, side. you're talking about, you know, the front and yeah, the one front, side... One side of the station to the other side of the station is a distance from With, safe to the front. Which blew my mind at the time. Yeah. I just, that just blew my mind because it was one side of Ukraine to the other and that's one side of our station to the other and it was just... Or like if we drive to Perth, we've driven across, across yeah, Ukraine. Yeah, it's, it's wild. Yeah. A landmark more than Lake Carnegie. Now that's kind of the biggest... Landmark. Yeah, on Google Maps. There it, should be... And it's like a little, it, it goes across and then it comes down a little bit like Don't this. Don't we have a tea towel that actually... Has Lake Carnegie on it. Yeah. Are you going to tea towel? <sighs> no, I don't think so. Effectively on Google Maps, if you search Prenty Downs Airport, um, you would pinpoint where we are, but... 
and um, that's in the wash. 180 kilometres south of the geographic centre of West Australia. It's it's hard to really... Um, yeah, it's hard to explain it more. There's not really any other big landmarks other than the no, lake. you just go... But you kind of go the South Australian border and go across, the top South Australian border and go across to the... Um, 20, 26th parallel. Yeah, to the west. Someone actually put our... There we go, coordinates are in there. Yeah. Um, do we have dingoes here? No. We have wild dogs. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those points where people get quite uh, contentious over, but... No, even the dog that I shot today is not a true dingo and you can get into the whole argument in DBCA about what um, a dingo is versus a wild dog and it comes up a lot with the video where I was doing the air shooting and it's like, oh, you shot a you know, dog, oh, poor dog. I can tell you what, if you're out and about in the bush and you come across a half-bred Alsatian with whatever anyone could know, you're going to be reaching for something because that dog was huge. He was a attack dog. I think it's a common misconception that wild dogs in the desert are all dingoes. Oh, hell um, no. And dingoes, no, dingoes are skinny. But also you go back and go, there's, and been, there's been so much... There's been so many dogs as pets up in these regions and so many that have run away, been let out, have just... Been unmanaged. Unmanaged, bred with the wild populations that when you do the DNA work on them now, at the very least in our region, when you do the DNA work on them now, it's like 10% dingo and 90%. No, they reckon it was like 2%. Mm. So, yeah, people love to say you're in the outback, you're in the desert, they're dingoes. No. <sighs> They're not anymore. They're wild dogs. No. Dingo is a breed of dog. No, they're, they're, they're apparently descendant of the Asian wolf. But the uh, biggest thing is that the wild dogs have actually killed the dingoes. Yeah. Because a dingo and a good dingo is quite small, petite. It's almost like a really good fox. I shot an amazing fox mm. a while ago and it was in top condition. And you can just tell that it was surviving off a diet of rare and endangered species. So. Yeah. Yeah. Would we love to come across a genuine dingo? Actually, Absolutely. no. I, you I, have, but I'd still love to come across one. Yeah. And I would compare a true full-blown dingo um, to like a Kelpie, really. They're much like the Kelpie. And they're a neat little short hair dog. Beautiful little points. Not all dingoes are white pointed dogs. Um, you can get brindle dingoes, but yeah, it's um, one that people will sort of stand their ground and fight over. It's quite contentious. But there is a, a massive system and it is a intricate system of balance out here in the environment that you have to try and fit into and make sure that you hit those points. and. We'll get into it when we get into an episode or a feature on the kangaroo management. And the brief summary is that you need to manage the macropods to ensure that they're not going to destroy your grasses and your, well, your perennial grasses and your trees and get them down to a population that is healthy for the landscape. Make sure that you manage your livestock to the manageable level and if you manage the macropods then you start working on the dogs and get the dogs to the right level and if the dogs and the feral well, not feral the wild dogs or dingoes are at a level where they have to work for their food they are skinny they are fit and they will target the kangaroos but because dogs are so opportunistic they will go to the next easiest target which is your rabbits and one of your other easy targets is your fox because the fox is competitive for the dog and the dog will take out the fox now we've got all of the problems we've got rabbits we've got foxes and we've got camels and dogs. We, we take care of the, the camels but if we get the kangaroos down to a level that is manageable the dogs will work hard for their food They'll be fitter, they'll be healthier, they'll be able to snap up the rabbits, they'll be able to take out the foxes, 
and we'll be able to make sure that some of our smaller native marsupials and birds, which we have got identified on the property as rare and endangered, are managed. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, because of the way that the system works here in Australia, like the carbon farming, where if you're doing the right thing, you're penalised. If you're doing the wrong thing, you're going to get a whole load of carbon credits to introduce things which are already proven and already effective, like we've done with the self-mustering yards. Yeah. Um, if we do anything that is to protect our native species, we will get penalised. Um, question, quite an interesting one, and I'll the, extra, the lecture ended. The lecture now. ended. Um, <laughs> what do you consider the biggest issue besides the camels? Kangaroos. Yeah, kangaroos. Kangaroos no, no, are actually, actually a bigger the, problem than yeah. the camels. It's just people don't like to hear it and talk about it. Yeah. Um, because they eat, you know, camels all the way up here, it's head. A kangaroo's down here and they'll limble the grasses down to next to nothing and even dig for the roots. Um, and once they start attacking those grasses, then obviously the grasses are struggling to grow and then that affects... Water use efficiency. Not just water use efficiency, well, but it affects I, all of the animals in the system. So, a kangaroo has a long diastema, which describes their teeth, which means that they've got the nibbly ability to chew up grasses and then also chew roots. As opposed to a goat or a sheep, goats have hooves and they can't dig. Whereas a kangaroo has got claws, a kangaroo will dig and dig and dig mm -hmm. all the way down underneath grasses and trees and they will eat the roots. Now the Karajong tree is known as a tree of life out here in the desert. The kangaroos will eat the roots of that and they will kill it because of the moisture in it. The kangaroo is the most destructive animal in the Australian outback and they are unmanaged and they've got too much of a they're on the coat of arms and too much of a protective scheme. And unfortunately, because of all of the bans on commercial use of camels and woke bloody brands saying, oh, we won't use kangaroo leather, kangaroos are going to get shot and just put in piles and wasted. They're also very, because they breed like rabbits. Um, kangaroo, Kang kangaroos are very good breeders, people. Um, Tra exporting the camels to the Middle East. Look, we've shot close to 700 this year. I'd pretty much guarantee you that the Middle East won't take 700 in a year. And that's just on our property, let alone all of the rest. So while it's a good, uh, it, it's a mini market. It's, it's quite a small market. Um, we've had conversations with people before for transporting them to the Middle East for things like camel racing. And they just don't want the product that we've got. Also, like, if you look at the camels today, they didn't run fast enough. Uh, goats? No, not here. No, really lucky we didn't have goats out here because they climb into trees and eat everything. They're like, they're the kangaroos of the trees. So, no, I, um, I have a bit of a passion on management of kangaroos. Uh, well, we're part of the problem. Um, we're the first to admit it, in a way. We put water we out put here. We put water out here. Without us out here farming our cattle, the water would not be here. Because of the access to water, it's created a good, a better environment for the kangaroos, which makes it so that they are more able to survive out here and to live. Okay, so, so we've put the water here for them, which has made them able to breed up to the numbers that they're at. So now it's our responsibility to manage them. So looking at the two big native species in Australia, you've got the emu and you've got the kangaroo, both on our coat of arms, always moving forwards. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, you're back in uh, No, no, um, I, I like, thanks, thanks Julia. Yeah. Uh, but the emus are limited on feed. As uh, someone pointed out, cam kangaroos always can have three babies at once. Absolutely, that's exactly. why they're such good breeders. And that's why Emus are limited on feed, kangaroos are limited on water because yeah. kangaroos can eat everything and anything. Emus are a seeds animal and so in a good year, like we stated earlier about the sandalwood, in a good year it will fruit, that means that there's food. In a good year an emu will breed. Yeah. Whereas a kangaroo, whenever it's got water, it can breed. They will run three babies at once and just keep pumping them out to the point where if they run out of water. And we had a great example over here at 
one of the X stations that got turned into conservation and land management, where they turned the water off and it just about ended up being a animal welfare crisis because of the number of kangaroos that were perishing and dying because it was just overpopulated. Yeah. It's just, it's, it is tens of thousands of kangaroos that are on our property. Yeah, heaps. Um, a bit about Danny. He's a man of few words, Danny is. He, today, he talked about being involved in more of it. The kids are wearing him down. The kids are wearing Danny down. I don't know, down. it might be his mates, like, Maybe it's zooming his mates in too. on it. Like, but Danny is a man of few words. Um, Danny's worked for the Carmody's for three years now, I think. Yeah. He's done a, couple, he's done a few years down on the farm with, un, under Tom and George. Yeah. Um, he, he, he started out, because he went to Wongatha. Yeah, so he if, went to the boarding school in Esperance, Wongatha. Yeah, if you jump back and look through some of our videos on the Windilla job, where you know, we had the lads, they're from the school that's in Gibson, which is just out of Esperance, and they are from up country a little way. Those lads, they came, come to the, the farm and they do some work every now and then. They're always paid for it. There's some people that think that they're not paid. Yeah, it's a and traineeship, apprenticeship. Danny was working his way through and he... We yeah. took him on as full-time once he graduated out of Wongatha. And then he finished his traineeship and then he's come up here to the station and he's he's, he's a legend. He's just happy. Yeah. But yeah, Danny is a man of few words and um, even if we get Danny on camera, you might not get... He's, he's not an ant, people. He is not... Um, He's not an ant, not on camera anyway. No. No. Um, yeah, didn't no. realise kangaroos were such a big problem. Ab not many people do. No, uh, well, not I mean, look, it's a huge thing that people turn around and say um, they didn't realise that there were camels in Australia. Yeah. And that's part of what we're, our entire channel is about making sure that we can Edu let people see. Let people see. Education. Yeah. But it's not just like, oh, here's a scientific report that no. says that the kangaroos are destroying the environment. No, we're going to show you what they're doing. Same with the camels, same with everything. So um, it, it's our... Someone had commented earlier on a video saying that it's not just us that deal with the camels and deal with the problems with the feral animals. No, it's not. This affects cap like properties hundreds, thousands of kilometres the rest of the way up. Absolutely. But we are in a position where... We're not afraid. Yeah, we're not afraid to show it. To show it, yeah. And we, we show you the work we do, the life we live, and I'm happy to jump in front of the camera because I know that there's people that aren't happy to jump in front of a camera and tell the story. But we need to tell the story from our our perspective on the land and us as producers, because it's something that, you know, farmers are often overlooked and not outspoken. And, you know, being able to jump in front of a camera and say, hey, look, jump in the car and show us, because so many farmers and producers want to just you know, they'll tell you, they'll you know, jump in the car and show you around the farm and tell you about everything so you can understand, so you can be educated and be informed as to how we live and why we do what we do. Now we've got the capability to do that across the entire globe. Yeah. And it's not just for us here in West Australia, it's for every farmer in West Australia and around Australia and then those who are in other countries because everyone's got struggles. They do. Um, well, we haven't mentioned horses. We do have horses too. We just haven't mentioned it. Not many anymore. Anymore. Yeah. Um, but yes, no, we do have horses and you're right, they do eat the grass down to the roots. Yeah, they do. Yeah. But they've got hard hooves and they can't do the little stumpy stump. <laughs> And get all the way down. But yes, no, yeah, horses are yeah, horse, out here. The horses are gone. Uh, in, in fact... <laughs> Hopefully I get some wicked footage of uh, finishing off yeah. the last of the horses on Prenti. But in fact, when did a station next door to us used to be where they... Um, Remount. Yeah, 
for the horses. So, yeah, there was a lot of horses in this area. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I think this is about the fifth time we're going to say it. I think it's time we go ahead our dinner. I don't know. Can someone convince us to stay on for longer? <laughs> like, I've... I've got a quarter of a beer left. Do we a run quarter, to the end? A quarter of a beer left. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, many people um, were shearers and roo shooters, actually. We know a few of those ourselves. <laughs> shearers and roo shooters. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, our mailman was a shearer for a very, very long time. He's done a really good job of avoiding being on camera. He's done a very good job of avoiding being yeah. on camera. Any rum? No, we're not. Oh, Adam, that's Adam. Adam. We're not really rum drinkers. No, no, no. I, well, We've got we, the gin. I had the rum the other day. Yeah, in Australia we measure time in beers. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, so the... No, because if we say it, Adam's going to send us a bottle of rum. No, Adam, stop. <laughs> stop sending us stuff. Please stop. Uh, yes, it is 4X he's drinking. Um, not by choice. It's unfortunately by situation. Yeah, I prefer Great Northern. We prefer Great Northern. Forex is not the choice. Yeah, no, it's... It, it was what was available and we weren't the ones purchasing. It's so. kind of like, you know, someone said earlier, I heard Australians don't drink Fosters. I've never had Fosters. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how many Queenslanders drink Forex. I've just had another beer. We better stay longer. Uh, do you reload your own ammunition? No. The time, people. It's the time. Different ammo, though. Different, yeah, but yeah, it, it takes a lot of time and we are time poor. And if we were to reload, we wouldn't be doing videos. Pretty much, yeah. It's, mm. um, do you want me to reload ammo or <laughs> show you me shooting stuff? But yeah, no, nah, Melbourne bitter, man. Not Victoria? No, although George's future father-in-law is a big fan of the VP. And John, Jono. Jono, yes. Yeah, the wax painting Jono. <laughs> Um, yeah, love the diversities. Thank you. The di- diversity is what we are. We're very diverse. We do. A lot. Someone said, love your network that you're doing. The network is great. Oh, and we do, like today, we did a bit of work on the network. The network, yeah. So we, yeah, it, it, the biggest thing is that we aren't just a shooting channel. Yeah, we do shooting. I pride in my work. I've got training um, in shooting and similar you know, fields. But uh, I have to admit that one of the things that I enjoy the most with firearms and the ballistic sports is, I guess, target shooting with my mates with pistols because I'm not shooting to kill. And there's people that are better than me. Yeah. I think, um, like, we've had a lot of people say, oh, why aren't you, why don't you have a motorbike and go out and get them on the motorbike? Where's the drone? Go get them with the drone. Why are you running through the bush? And that's because we're at work. We've driven out in the work with all the tools on the back, with ladders or trap, uh, a trap yard, with trap gate we've got today. Also, and it's while we're driving from one water point to the next or from home out to the job that we're coming across these camels. It's not, I'd almost say it's not, it's not going out hunting for pleasure. It's not the pleasure activity. It's while you are working during the day, doing the management of the station, we are coming across the camels. Yeah, and then when we do a specific mm. job, when we say, yes, we've got the camels to take care of and we're gonna go out and take them out. Oh yeah, no, we've got the tools. We, we run the buggy, we, run the aircraft and we do a blocking run with the aircraft to make sure that the camels can't run away, then we get into them. That's a whole different ball game. That's when we're going industrial. That's when the day's entire purpose is... To take out is, the problem. Yes. Today, you shot, what, 40 camels? And your job today was going down and checking on a couple of water points that were getting a bit slow on the water. So, and, and, that's, and that's the difference. Um, Ant's alien episode was definitely our diverse subject. Oh, yeah, no, we've got another one on that, which is... Jack, um, Jack does love his conspiracy sp- theories. No, space facts. You'd like your space... But it's like, it, also- it, before we edit up a space facts episode, how much does a NASA astronaut suit cost? Because I can tell you it costs more than a station. That is wild. 
An Australian or USD? USD. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. So, no, it's, um, yeah, we, we do a, a bit of everything. And that's what we aim to sort of teach people that you, you, we're dynamic. We do a lot of different things. Occasionally we're doing mining work. I mean, hell, we've got the episode which is coming out tomorrow where we're doing some mining rehab and then we get very inconvenienced by a group of camels. Yeah, which is the one we're eating. That's the one we're eating. Um, Have we ever tried growing dates out here? We actually did have one date. Oh, a date palm. palm. We had one date palm that Jack's brother and sister-in-law bought us for Christmas. No, was it Christmas or wedding gift? No, it was Christmas. Um, what we didn't realise at the time is that you need a female and a male, and we only had one. Um, and also then we weren't as established as we are now with our retic, and we just couldn't keep the water up to it at Although the time. things that are growing well at the moment are grapevine. the grapevine mm. and the olive tree. Now, we've got a lot of limestone, so we should be able to grow some good wine. I'm a fan of Tempranillo red wine. I want to get Spanish varieties of grape to grow in the centre of West Australia because they we, we, we have a huge potential to grow great wine out here. The other thing is that we should be pumping water from the Ord, which just gets dumped into the bloody ocean, down through the centre of West Australia and start irrigating everywhere. We could have our own green zone. It would be amazing. And I just saw someone ask, does your wife shoot? Um, basically, the first time that JH came up to the station and was introduced to Jasmine, Jasmine pulled off a freehand 100 metre headshot on a kangaroo and he said, you better not ever mess around on that woman. No, look, <laughs> yes. Look, at the end of the day, I am, we've got a five, or oh, she's about to be six. We've got a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a three-year-old. And I do school at home with them Monday to Friday. And we just don't get, I just don't get the chance. We did, you, you did some shooting in the sausage episode. Yeah. But that's, that, that was, yeah, your mum was up here and your mum had the kids and the camels were five k's from home. At the end of the day, I just I just don't know if to get the chance. Most of the time, Jack sees them. Heck, ninety percent of the time, you see them when you're at work during the day. I'm at home with the kids in the schoolroom, mm. so I just don't get the chance. The most I tend to shoot these days is the birds around the house, really. Although we had a great one. Sorry, you will never see this. Um, <laughs> we were out with a couple of mates, Lou and Bruce, and we were. Oh yeah. You know, shooting some camels. Jasmine was up in the bird and she was, you know, calling us in on target. I was driving and the guys, Lou and Bruce, it was the first time they'd ever come into doing feral operations and they weren't shooting fast enough. Bruce was worried about brass. Lou was worried about perfect shots. Um, Which is another problem with reloading our own brass is collecting it. Collecting it, mm. yeah. Basically, if we catch it, we keep it. Otherwise, it just goes. Yep. But yes, they were they were taking, trying to catch their brass. Yeah, taking time and everything. And eventually, Jasmine just said, no, nah, I've had enough of this. So then Bird got put down. She jumped out. She grabbed one of the rifles. She was in the passenger seat. And she just started unloading on, on the camels. And that was a 80, 90 camel day. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think it was. Um, yes, someone just got Googled how much NASA... Suit the astronauts yeah. costs, yeah. and it is wild. It is insane. Uh, wild. So that is that it is fifteen to twenty million. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. What could you do with that? Are, are we interested in space, or do we want to make sure the Earth is like good enough? I, I appreciate a whole lot of research that we do in um, space. It's great. Would a three hundred three take down a camel? Oh, okay. I'm going to have to do a shout out straight to this person. Okay. Who, who is it? It's... It's not a name that's easy. Uh, C-L- okay. Pe- peppers? Yeah, Peppers. We're just going to run with Peppers. Peppers, 303's Popper the Camel. <laughs> I've dropped camels out at 350 yards with the 303. 
sweet, it's beautiful, but it was my brother's 303. Now, I've got a video somewhere in amongst everything. He's wearing a really nice safety helmet and... <laughs> that's very, very old, that's very, very old footage. No, the, the posty run. I don't think, oh, Yeah, no, the Tom posty and I were on it? the, yeah. Oh, no, that was you and George. Yeah, and he, um, yeah, put out his 303, dropped the camel, and we had steak and suds that night. <laughs> uh, one shot, beautiful. Just, the camel was walking along, and it was just thunk, mm. all the way down. Yeah. Uh, the 303 is great on camels, and it, you can rattle the rounds off beautifully, and efficiently and that's why I bought the AIA Enfield Pattern 762 because I'd done work with a 303 and just went it is the fastest bolt action rifle ever produced and it works. Well, what you've used a 303 on camels obviously a 308 um your okay well the list of things that I've used on a camel it like no I'm thinking calibers the 223 you've used we could start at the bottom okay go from the bottom 22 20, you, you, 22 you've, Magnum. You've used them, they're just not... Always effective. They're yeah. not great. No, so it's 22, 22 Magnum, 357, 38 Special, 44 Magnum. Two two three two fifty. 250. Have you used the 250 on account? Three oh, no, you've used Tom's 250. Mum's. Mum's, Mum's 250. 250. The family one. George's 250. Yeah. Um... 306. You've used your... 300 Win Mag. 300 Win Mag, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, 338 Winchester Magnum. That was pretty good. Shotgun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was using 12 gauge on a camel. It, um, it just tickles them a little bit, really. No. No, we used Buckshot 00 SGs chasing them through the bush. <laughs> God, that was... Whew, that was Tom and I. When shooting yeah. camels, do they generally die quickly? Again, it comes down to shot placement. Oh, anything. Yeah, it, it just yeah. shot placement. But no, we, so you ended up in that question of ethics about, you know, oh, quick death, long death. Um, yeah. We consider a long death, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, we, yeah, we, we try to make sure that we do a quick death, but Biggest thing is that we need to end the camel. No matter what we're doing, we need to end them. And so there are occasions where we go for, and this is where one of the short videos, people go, oh, that's horrible, that's cruel. I'm actually aiming for a point here through the camel. And I pointed out in the video that comes out tomorrow night, but when you've got the camel running away from you, there's a point that you can shoot just above the tail, and if you get the angle right, you're going straight through, blasting it out through the neck, and you're taking out the heart. And that is about a 25 to 30 second death, and we've done that frequently because it is sometimes the best angle that you've got, but you're taking out the heart and the major arteries, and the animal dies in 30 seconds. It's called the big game shot, and I've never been a big fan of it. I used to never shoot anything that was moving. However, now I've got an operational need where I need to drop everything and then I tidy them up afterwards. And that's where, when we come down to doing tidy up work, it would be amazing in Western Australia if we were allowed to use our sidearms to actually finish off camels because, you know, it, it's ridiculous that I'm, not, I'm allowed to carry a pistol, but I'm only ever allowed to use it for self-defense inside a yard on feral animals or wild cattle mm -hmm. where I'm shooting a lot more animals out in the field and then I have to spend another almost two dollars to do the second shot where I could be spending 30 cents on a nine mil. So well, lecture two over. Yeah I was gonna say <laughs> we, you know, we've been on for an hour and a half now. All right, well, people are interested. I didn't realise it had been an hour and a half. Well, that's because you're not drinking wine. It's been an hour and a half. Um, Esther says, um, as far as she knows, it's hair. Wool is just the sheep. And we can use the spinning wheel that your mum had at Claire Downs. Well, Esther actually made a little... That's what she's saying. I've still got the beanie. Use the spinning wheel that yeah. Molly's had at Claire Downs. Yeah. yeah. 
No, so Esther, and this is where the whole international everything comes in. Esther's like an older sister to me. Um, um, she came and worked on the farm back in the 90s. Correct me if I'm wrong, Esther, but <laughs> you taught me a lot of things. Abseiling, climbing, yeah. how not to kill myself with a rope. Um, deer and pigs in our area. Well, down, you get deer down on the farm. Yeah. Pigs are way up in, in the north. We don't have wild pigs in this region. No, Geraldton. The lads have problems with um, oh, yeah, and, that was a... and Murchison River. Yeah, with pigs. Yeah. Yeah, right. But they got the goats too. Yeah, well, yeah, sometimes you can't help yourself. No. But no, we don't have pigs. What state are you guys in? WA, Western Australia. Yeah, the way to wild state. It's a little less progressive than the rest. Um, why are they preserved for the hunters? Well, I just don't think... I think most people just, yeah. And deer pigs and... I'm just trying to put that last bit together. Uh, so, Wim, through one. Uh, it, it's not actually that they're preserved for the... Hunters? No, hunters. I just no. think that mostly it's just what you see on YouTube is probably... Hunting. Hunting. Yeah. hunting. Like, I... It, what it, what it we is, do with the camel is not hunting. No, it has been so long since I've actually... Hunted. Gone hunting. And the last time I went hunting, I didn't fire a shot and we didn't kill an animal. And it was really good. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it. And you will not find a video where we say that what we are doing is hunting no. camels. We are controlling them and we are culling them. And people go, oh, you know, you're trying to exterminate them. Yeah. We are. I'm sorry, but they're a pest, they're a problem, and we are legally obliged to shoot and make best effort to kill every single declared, declared pest. feral pest. And that is in our lease. Yeah. Um, it's our agreement between us and, uh, used to be between us and Lizzie, but yeah. it's now Charles. Yeah. And SLR, yeah, no, sorry, can't have them. Yeah. Um, the SLR is good <laughs> on camels. It, it is effective. Um, but, yeah, we, we aren't allowed to have them anymore. Because, no. yeah, it's a little unfortunate because we're not... What is it? We're perceived as a threat to public safety if we have a self-loading rifle, even the old L1A1, which... Yeah, it's kind of a good It's fascinating tool. because I think that any of our guns could kill someone. Yeah. I don't think it matters about how rapidly they shoot, really. No, it all comes down to trigger discipline. Yeah. 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 That's uh, politics. <laughs> and that's the biggest thing about, you know, if a politician ever watches this and comes out outside of Perth. Now, in West Australia, we have this thing called the escarpment. And Perth is on the sandlands below that, which is effectively all the erosion from the hills. And we've worked out that if a politician tries to make their way over the escarpment, they'll get a blood nose. <laughs> and the blood nose is actually catastrophic and they won't actually be able to survive. So there's a massive amount of blood loss. And they just... <laughs> Yeah, no, they can't come out here and see what the real deal is. And Says the man who ran in politics. What does it say about yourself? Sometimes there needs to be someone in there that knows what they're doing <laughs> and happy to get their the hands blood dirty. Mm. Like, get the blood in your hands. Jesus. <laughs> like, that's, that's the biggest disconnect. We've got people who yeah. are just career politicians. They've never done the job. And they've ever, ever actually been out there and got their hands dirty. If they have, they've forgotten where they came from and what they did in a previous life and they have completely and utterly disrespected everyone else that has done that job. <clears throat> so um, I'll leave that one uh, and up to everyone else's. Uh... How <laughs> are the 165 grainers through the Wedgetail? Now, the 165s through the wedge tail go really well and she is operating very smoothly. 
And the big thing with the um, 165s or even just soft point rounds inside the magazine, and I'm not sure if anyone who deals with ARs and the like, but I recharge my mags. So when I'm working through a magazine, I'll change when I can. But I've noticed that I'm getting a little bit of blunting on the ends of my soft points. So in the magazine, as it shoots, we have it um, bump the front of the magazine. You can see it when you strip a magazine, you've got those little smears and I've ended up with a couple of dumb, dumb rounds effectively. So yeah, not it's, really. it, it goes, they go well. I haven't had any malfunctions while running those 165s and those soft points. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that yeah, comes down to just recycling everything through the system. And as with all good videos, we started out going, this is going to be cooking with the camel. And we've gone diverted into killing. Com but that's not the only diversion. Okay, completely yeah. diverted. Yeah. Um, I have to deflate my Santa Claus. It is that time of the year. <sighs> this is it. I, I'll be back. I have to deflate my Santa Claus. Yeah. But it, it is interesting. Like, I... Um, yeah, you've seen a bit of my shooting and some of my not the best shooting I've done, but with, um, with a semi-automatic, the efficiency level increases significantly. Like, it's ridiculous. When you look at it, you can just squeeze off another round really quickly and just keep working it. And it's actually one of the things that's become um, interesting is when comparing our shooting to the government department shootings. And if anyone goes, oh, your shooting is, is shocking. Yeah, try and get a video of their work because we got told we had to record our shooting to substantiate the numbers that we were getting. And when it came to a government sponsored shoot where we actually had to contribute funds to it, I said, oh, well, same, same, same here's the camera, you go film it and show me how you kill and what job you do. They said, no, 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 we're not allowed to show you that because that's, you know, that's, that's not, not okay. It's, you know, we can't ever, they take 10 shots per kill as an average to take out the camels. So that's why it costs them $150 an animal and it costs us $25 an animal because we pay for the ammunition they don't, they also don't have the skills. Yeah, um, yeah, distaste for PPU ammo, yeah, but it was cheap and we bought it in bulk, so we're just going to keep using it until we're done with it. Look, the PPU worked through my yeah, I mean, old rifle. Yeah, yeah, no, it did, it was great. Yeah, I put a bit over 10,500 rounds of PPU through my Remington 700, which anyone familiar, it's based, well, 700 and the M24 are very similar. So it's actually a 762. And it's only when you get a Remington 700 blue printed that they will end up being tighter. And that's when they get very finicky with their ammunition. Mm. Whereas if they're set up for a 762 military ammo, they go well, I mean, hell, I was putting almost a thousand rounds a day through my Remington 700 and I was carrying two, three rifles when I was shooting thousands of camels from the ground. Yeah. Um, Little Hills, how do you buy food in bulk? We touched on it a little bit earlier in the video. Um, online orders. Online orders, but yeah. Uh, click and collect. The best thing that ever happened to you know a lot of shopping was COVID and working out this whole click and collect system was oh, quite We can handy. get into all the broken systems with COVID and shopping though. But uh, we actually did a little bit of recording on how we sort out the groceries and the shopping and do the, um, yeah, doing the town runs when, well, we did it just this week because we've only just gotten back yesterday. Um, but that could take us a bit to get forward. So just watch this space on how we manage the groceries. How far are we from Jundee? I say not that far, and not that far, I think, is 
150, 200 guys, which isn't really that far. Um, how far are we from town? Um, I guess it depends on what you consider a town. We are, I guess, 299 k's from Waluna and we're about 260 from Laverton. Those are both considered towns. However, they are not um, shopping hubs. They each have one small um, independently owned grocer. Um, so you can get your, let's say your emergency needs, but by no means is it your, you know, standard size shopping center. It is just a small independent grocer. Um, so our nearest shopping town is 650 kilometers away. Half of that is on unsealed roads, half of it is on sealed roads. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a seven hour drive down and a seven hour drive back. Um, and that's to Kalgoorlie in WA. Um, yeah, we should eat soon. Oh, no, it's definitely cold. Dinner is definitely cold. Yeah, no, we'll microwave that. That's fine. You, you guys have us for another <laughs> hour. Go for it. I gather you use the Savannah for the local stuff, but use the Ventura for flying down to the southern property. Ah, Mark. Yeah. No, um, love the throttle system. Like that, that Vernier system on the, Vin, uh, on the Savannah is great. But... Uh, no, we use the Savannah for all of the work on the station, and at the moment, the Ventura has spent a lot of time in a hangar. Um, but our plans with the Ventura were very much to be able to fly the family, you know, down to Esperance or to Kalgoorlie or whatever. But it will also have its place on the station because there's many a times when we could fly three people three people up to a job mm. instead of just flying one person up to a job so the venturers are definitely going to have you know station work to do um but yeah mostly the savannah is what's getting used but that's also because it's a bit smaller and you're so used to it now you've flown the savannah so so very much yeah it's quite nimble it's mm. good um mm. doesn't overheat and doesn't have ecu problems it is the big thing why, thank you, Wim. We're hoping we can get to 145,000 one day. Bit of a storm outside. How far is it from one end of the station to the other? Top to bottom, 70. Kilometres. Yeah, sorry, kilometres. Yeah. Top and to bottom is 70 kilometres. What we've got though in the middle is a salt lake, which you have to, so we're here. Well, no, you've got, if, if you've you got to go down line. and around and up to get to the top. Mm. Um, it probably takes us to get up to Freshwater is a three hour drive. From the homestead up to Freshwater would be three hours. To Freshwater, yeah. Yeah, to three hours. Down to the southernmost, so down to Sweetwater, which is on our southern boundary, is 45 minutes. Yeah, about that. Mm. But the big thing is it's 20 minutes flight in the Savannah, anywhere on the station. Uh, our aircraft are not considered ultra lights. They are light sport aircraft. Now, what I would love to see in Australia is the light sport, uh, light sport aircraft classification for helicopters because then I could have a lot of fun. I love helicopters. It's, it's the thing that I, I enjoy. How many head of cattle do we run? Breeding cows we've got. Around 3.3 is our breeding herd. So 3,300. So we are relatively small in the game of uh, pastoral but this property has been known to run up to 7,000 breeding head, but we've made a decision to make sure that we have it a little bit lower because, you know, averages. You just run it on averages. If we try to run the country as hard as you can, yeah, cool, you might get a, like a boom, but then you'll also get a bust where you've got a whole lot of cattle which die unseen under the camera. Mm. Um, do you ever take on people for volunteer work? We have not in the past. Oh, yeah. We have not taken on people for volunteer no, work. No, it's um, an insurance nightmare. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we're really, really careful about some of these things. Yeah, you'd be surprised. We're going to get into it. You'd be surprised what the cattle eat out here. A lot of people think because we don't have um, irrigated 
pasture paddocks that there's nothing out here. No, uh, so we're in shrublands. We so are in shrublands. they actually eat a lot of trees as their their food. And why I'm a little tentative about doing an episode on what do they eat is because well, I don't want to end up in a situation where people critique everything that we do. And if I jump in there and go, oh, yeah, they eat this, this and this. They're going to be told, no, they don't. No, they don't. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of food out here, which, interestingly, from some of the research from UWA, the animals are eating things which no one ever thought they would. But I guess at the end of the day, you know, to the best of your knowledge, this is what they eat. Yeah. And we've got the book and, as and well. we're more than happy for other people to say you know that one stand you know you talked about that tree over there jack but they actually eat that one over there too and mm. we just may not know it yet we're always prepared to learn um but there's a difference between learning something in a nice way and being attacked with the information yeah which unfortunately is the big downside of being on but a forum out, such out as there YouTube. And mm. Up front. So, uh, yeah, Mark's saying it's CASA and it will never happen. Well, CASA are getting a little bit better and... They are a bit. Yeah. Brahmin crosses, no. Brahmin are pretty as babies, but they're not very... Mm. No, we don't uh, have Brahmins. Sorry, Mup Dog saying you're, they're ex-aircraft, aren't they? Made for ironing out the bugs. They are experimental and that's why, like, ICP haven't really run the aircraft that much in Australia. And yeah, we are, but we paid full price for an aircraft which was meant to be Australia ready. And I can tell you that those aircraft are not Australia ready but at we, all. No, but we will leave it at that. Um, breeder cattle we run, that's three people now. Yeah, what's the main breeder cattle we have? Shorthorn Cross Santa. Uh, no, Jamil's close there. Close. Uh, we have a couple of Herefords. Herefords, yeah. There's the British breed. So we are. Um, yeah, British mm. breeds. And we do have a few of the Herefords, but yeah, the Shorthorn is one of those classic British Taurus breeds. Do you know much about the native flora? flora? Oh, a bit. Um, not me, Jack. And your mum. Your mum's really quite good with it too. No, and we've got the book which we've just stuffed full oh, of samples. Oh, that book I do. Yeah. That book I do have. No, so it's uh, a classic where we've. I'm not sure how much you've seen it, and how much I've kept in there. But we've got the. And I'm not a geologist, but we've got my alternate, which is I'm not a so botanist, we, but this is our <laughs> book. And all those gaps there is where we've shoved like the samples of the plants. So we, you know, get the sample, find where we think it belongs and match it up. So this is our flora book for the station. But we've also got a app on our phone, which is pretty good. The yeah. Rangeland book is on our phone. Yeah. And a big concern we have is talking about a large part on stations is this idea of doing a rangeland monitoring survey and we don't want to do anything that could be perceived as educational because then we might get attacked by the department because they'll yeah. say, oh, you've done it wrong. And they are more and very willing to jump on anyone that tries to tell anyone how to do anything. Um, Jamil, is it? Um... Oh. We've got an email address or you can contact us through our website. Um, yeah. Now, I'm really interested about those Jersey Cross Herefords because, yeah. I'd love a milking cow, but he keeps telling me no. No. Well, that's where you get your brindles. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's one thing that we aren't massive on in our channel is always sort of saying, hey, everyone, throw us a like and subscribe and a thumbs up because it feels so goddamn corny to do it but we also um have started doing a little bit of merch and brett's reminded me to brett's embroidery yeah tell you that we do have hats bucket caps and caps and they're available through the brett's merchandise which will um somehow rope into this but it's um yeah, we're 
it's a little bit tentative and our big thing is that we're not trying to make money. We want to expose everything or everyone to what we're doing and then if we cover our costs and then make a little bit of revenue for the kids, um, parents and community association, yeah. PNC. PNC. Yeah. Would be pretty amazing because that's the main thing is education, kids' education, and then keeping everything going. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other people are popping off to go eat some dinner, so. Yep. Right. It's getting late. What are we? Nine o'clock. Nine p.m. Yeah. We should go eat this camel because it's. Um, it's nine p.m. It's nine. Okay. Camel in bed. Yeah, camel in bed. It's not even Wednesday. It's Thursday. I know. Oh, hump day, Jesus. <laughs> I was going to say, he is being very noisy he out is. there. He has been very noisy. We he, almost thought about calling him Humphrey. He is very noisy. Can you put a link for the merch into your vids? That'd be great. Yep, absolutely we can. We'll get onto that. Um, yeah. That's Hasta luego. Yeah, we'll go eat our dinner. Cheers. Cross. Catch on the flip side. <laughs> oh, it's on this one. Yeah. Right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>